I wanted to do something different. I wanted to improve more decisions and faster. I'm a strong believer that if we improve even 1% of decisions, but we do it at a at scale and constantly, we can really achieve results equally or even better than if we spend a lot of time solving fewer problems. In order to do this, I knew that I had to get closer to operations. So that, that was clear in my head. However, when I joined Brownwatch, I found myself doing the same I did when I was a data scientist. It was okay. I was still solving problems. I was still spending a lot of time doing the same. So I knew that something had to change. I was lucky enough to work with a bunch of people. And we basically came up with a framework. Frameworks are cool. Why? I'll say because first, you can make diagrams. Second, it's a bit of creativity with science. It makes you look interesting. And I hope I look interesting today. Raise your hands. Anyone, not hands, hands, or if you want to raise two, you can do it. If anyone that has heard about any of these two frameworks or cycles, Okay, so this is not a biology conference, so I assume it's not the Assess, Plan, and Act, because basically it's a framework for um, species preservation. But I'm sure that, yes, build, measure, and learn. Lean startup methodology, I'm sure most of us are familiar with that. So you will tell me, okay, Fernando, are you going to explain about the build, measure, and learn? I will say not really, although yes. I have my own build, measure, and learn version. It's not my own, but I will say that it's my own. And why then creating another framework? So basically, build, measure, and learn it, it works uh, amazingly. However, I needed something that, was, that really filled the gaps that I was looking, that I was having in my team, and the organization itself. And build, measure, and learn was fine for product managers, for everyone, but really it wasn't for me. Uh, there were some missing pieces in there that I tried to fill them up. And that's when we came up with plan track experiment. If you see even, I put a this more square in there, because tracking is not in build, measure, and learn, even though it's, it's implicit, but I really wanted to make tracking implicit, uh, explicit, because tracking is so important, as was uh, been said before. So these are checklists to be followed every time you want to solve a user problem. Why a checklist inspiring the checklist manifesto book? Uh, Actually, checklists are really important for the aviation industry. They prevent accidents. They really make complex things to be really, really simple. And it's not a process. It's not, okay, do one, two, three, and everything's going to be fine. No, it's mostly, okay, have you done this? Do you remember about this? How can we actually inspire some discussions about this topic? So it's not a process. It's something that basically is meant to inspire. It's meant to guide people towards um, a certain goal in case of the aviation industry, okay, please don't make the plane crash, which is important. I'll say probably as, as important as tracking, or maybe not, but similar. So basically, a checklist has this structure, two, two elements, the task and the action. Let's imagine that someone wants to have 50 minutes of silence, and the action, in this case, will be, okay, meditate. But you will say, okay, but meditation, 15 minutes of silence, okay, makes sense, but well, what's the point? The thing is that when we actually go and tell someone, okay, meditate, we're actually giving someone something that you, they can find on the internet. They can go to YouTube, they can go to a blog post, they can go even to India for a yoga retreat. So basically, we're giving them even a, some structure into what they actually want to do so they can even commit more to it. It's not just about having 15 minutes of silence. It's about meditation itself. So we can guide this person to actually have the 15 minutes of silence in the best way possible. So that's the approach that we, we came up with. And it's a really simple example. Task, something that needs to be done in experimentation. Pick the experimentation method that best fits your case. And the action, click here to see a video. That's it. Like Really, we're just driving people to click in the video, because in the video, we're going to explain how to assess which experimentation method to use according to the bet 
value and risk. Bet, basically, something that is going to be built. So um, this allowed us to really have a lot of things in just one Confluence page. I'm not uh, promoting Confluence, but that's what we use. So if someone asks me, OK, how do you experiment? I send one link. That's it. And in there, we have all the links necessary to actually perform an experimentation program, uh, the resources. Everything is in there. Just click in there, documentation, loom videos, external resources, et cetera, et cetera. So the plan phase really is just about understanding how the, u the user, how users are going to benefit from what we're going to build, and how are we actually making sure that the user is benefiting from it. And that's where product analytics comes into place. It really shines there. If we build this, user cohort will benefit in this way, increasing progress metric by X percent. That's really the goal of this, where we want to go. We define progress metrics. We define three levels, primary, informative, and guardrail. Primary is just basically whatever we want to improve. And this is really the main metric, what we focus on that. Uh, informative is really, OK, what do we want to understand? How can we actually set up some metrics to understand something? And here, we're making a lot of effort to work along with user researchers, because they're really the ones that have a lot of questions. And when we work with them, we are, we're actually able to come up with really good metrics. Of course, that's our, um, our role, I will say, just basically transforming ideas, questions, hypotheses into metrics because that's the way product analytics is being done. I hope so, or I think so, I don't know. And guardrail, basically something that we don't want to affect negatively. Uh, a really simple example, uh, I don't do e-commerce, but I assume that we don't want to affect sales, right? We don't want to affect the, the amount of purchases that someone does. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's something that we don't want to affect. A uh, really simple example, it can get way more complex, especially if you are a, a SaaS software where re there's no just check out. It's kind of like we don't even want. It. We don't even sometimes know what users are really trying to do. They just simply do it. Um, so it can become a bit, a bit tricky, but at least if we have defined the three levels, we try to, to push towards that. Track, really important, really, 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 really important. And sometimes this is really uh, left, as I will say, the last thing to do. And at some point, even sometimes things are released without the tracking. And hopefully that's, that is not happening in, in, in your case. And if that happens, you can learn from this. There are three things that are key in here. The first one is a tracking champion. A tracking champion is generally a front-end developer that is interested in product analytics. It's just like a, a front-end developer. But we just ask, OK, who's interested in product analytics? And the one that raises the hand, boom, is going to be engaged. That's it. It's as simple as that. It's just about creating ownership. OK, you are the champion. You are here to be the champion. You are the champion. That's all we need. And suddenly, this front-end developer works so smoothly with analysts. He's so engaged. He does the tracking, no moaning, even <laughs> I don't know, like even Jira tickets are happy, you know? And second component, tracking guidelines. Of course, syntax, okay, really, how do we want this to, to be called? I'm not going to talk much about this, but really, the, how events are, are described, track properties and everything really makes everything uh, to be a bit, I'll say, we can call it self-service analytics. We actually want PMs to go into into, into the product analytics tool, probably here. You know that. You want that, you know? Product managers to really understand events so they can actually self-serve. So re this is really important. And a tracking map. I'm going to uh, talk about this a bit later. So basically, three things that we want to, to achieve. To focus on the job to be done, a KI funnel. Align tracking with questions to answer no track everything approach. Um, I don't have anything against auto tracking, but I, would, I believe that if the, the tool doesn't support auto tracking, it's better to plan really what you want to, 
uh, to track because then it can become very, very messy. And to make sure the team aligns on what we want to track. That's a tracking map. What is a tracking map? Headbook. What is fed? Headbook. Okay. You can understand what is headbook. I tried to just make something funny there. It didn't work. No one laughed. <laughs> but let's say this is a tracking map. Next button, we want to know which membership is selected the most. So the phone is here, really simple. And the question is, do we need this event if we actually want to know which membership is selected the most? Probably not, right? But actually, sometimes the user researches us this, yeah, we need. And actually, I say, yeah, why not? But then we just add, add another question that says, you know, it's not, it's not going to be a debate about, okay, no, we don't want to track this. But at least having a question in there makes everything different, you know, because at least everyone knows, okay, why are we tracking this? There is a question, there is a hypothesis. So um, just read this, a funnel, UI screenshots, exactly how the, how the product looks like, events there, questions there, tracking champion, this is what we want, Jira ticket, amazing, boom, it worked. It's not simple, but at least hopefully it's like that. <laughs> so yeah, funnels, UI screenshots with events, plus questions to answer, and mostly important, everything agreed. Because sometimes you say something, I say something else, and tracking, and coding, and things, and that, then we realize that actually, but I didn't mean that. It's like, ooh, okay, whose fault is this? Is the, I don't know, the tracking map fault. But, so, and then experiment. Um, the main components are, okay, pick the experimentation method, know how long the experiment will take, and schedule reports. And believe it or not, scheduling reports is really important because how we communicate, how we deliver actually the, the results uh, can make a big, a big difference. For example, sometimes learnings happen even months after the release. So imagine if we just simply send a report uh, and then no one looks at it, then we might be missing something that might have changed in the, in the coming months. So if we share reports, we actually uh, make sure that every month or every week depend, depends on, the, on, on uh, how, how long it has, uh, it has happened before actually, well, depends in a lot of things. If it's one week, one month, I'm not gonna explain that, but just share it, make it recurrent until one point when, every, when everyone says, okay, yeah, it's, it's enough. We learn from this, everything is clear. And this is, I will say, an ideal world. Learnings inform the next iteration as they are transformed into ideas. And these ideas get added to a team's backlog for prioritization. So I'm using the word learnings in here. <clears throat> and learning is really hard. It's really, 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 really hard. Uh, someone has tried to, I don't know, to code, to learn guitar, or even just simple things as, I don't know, like making a chair out of wood and no one knows actually how to, to make it work. Okay, but anyway, at some point if you practice, you practice, you fail, you try, you fail again, you learn, okay, but it's just something that happens organically, it really is hard to know how actually we came up with a chair after many learnings. But it is hard. It is really, really hard. And imagine if it's hard on a personal level, no, imagine on a team level, how hard it is to make a team learn. No? How can we actually make that happen? You know? Now imagine at an organizational level, how can we actually make a complete organization, thousands of people, to actually be able to learn? So it's really, really complex. And the key about learning is really how, how to get the learnings and make them specific for each person's role. This is really, I, I would say, the key, uh, because there might be insights, there might be learnings, there might be like conference pages, there might be like uh, narratives, presentations, everything about really, this is the learning. But someone might say, okay, how do I act upon that learning? That's really the hardest part. How do I act upon the learning is the key. On the experiment phase, 
two ways of doing this, ship and measure and A-B testing. Uh, ship and measure when there are uh, low risk, high confidence bets. Uh, we simply ship and measure. Uh, we tried still to get enough sample size on the, on the user cohort that actually saw the, the new feature, a new change. So we actually at least get some statistical rigor in there even though it's already gone and there's really no causality in there because there's no A-B testing. And A-B testing, I won't explain this. Come on, it's crap talks, you know? I think everyone knows about this. And this can get really difficult in here. And probably, yeah, no, I'm not gonna do it. Last slide, I was mentioning it. I be became even a bit poetic about learning, but really learning is hard. It's really hard. Uh, I actually, I, I tried to switch from R to Python for some reason, and it was so hard. I stopped and I realized that I love R, that's it. When I was saying, okay, yeah, really learning is about how, how do you make someone get the learnings and make the learnings actionable is really the hardest part. And, and so this is something that we are really just the beginning of this. We haven't really tried much. Uh, it's just kind of agreed, but there's no real way of saying, okay, yeah, we've nailed it. We know how to do this. But at least what we're trying is to, okay, how can we make user researchers learn? How can we actually make them understand how to action on the learnings? If we actually understand how to make one role, which is quite close to, to product analytics, learn and act up, up upon something, okay, what is the next step? We can apply the same methodology to another role up to the point that we can actually even say, okay, the CPO has its own way of learning and we know how to make him learn. We're still a long way until we get there, but that's the point. So, as I said, frameworks are lovely. This art, science, and a bit of Miro as well. How basically do we do stuff in here? Uh, generally, we don't use quant data to um, to define user problems. Uh, this is generally done by, by user research. Uh, they are the ones that are talking with the, with, with the users. However, what we do is, for example, we make them understand what's the scale of it, who's suffering it, at which stage of the life cycle. What we try to do is, okay, user researchers, they know uh, uh, one reality. They, they have asked questions to one, two users, uh, six, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know really the numbers, but they're not, they're not really big. And what we do is, okay, how can we actually show them how it looks on a bigger sample? But we need to really understand the user problem and try to some way show it on, 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 on a product analytics tool. And then, okay, user problem, solution, this experimentation bit, monitor user behavior. And then the learnings, feedback into the user problem, the foundational research that actually triggered uh, the, the solution at, at first. So, um, Ideally, if we actually get, if we actually master uh, making user researchers learn, then we can apply the same, the same process, same framework, same way of, of teaching things to other roles, going probably up to CPO, who knows? And, but yeah, and I hope that this checklist inspire you, or at least you got some, some ideas coming from here, and I hope as well that I inspire you to go and learn R. <laughs> Thank you very much.